My name is Stephen Rogers. Good morning on this very beautiful Thursday morning here in Washington, D.C. And um, I am the executive director for Africa Faith and Justice Network. I see a lot of familiar faces here. So, But for those who are joining us for the first time, either as speakers or as audience members, the AFJN is a 40-year Pan-African Catholic faith-based organization. We are the only Catholic faith-based organization that does advocacy here in Washington, D.C., and we are mostly focused with U.S.-Africa relations in terms of improving that relationship, but also working on the continent to improve governance and women's empowerment and other programs. We work in different countries, including Ghana, Nigeria, Cameroon, Tanzania, um, Zambia, and other countries. Today, we are having a discussion on a very important issue. And I want to just also, on behalf of the organizers, our, our co-organizers who, who worked with us here to do this together. And this includes the African Great Lakes Action Network, the American Friends Services Committee, the Friends of the Congo, and Pax Christi USA. So together we have come together to organize this book discussion on who are my people, love, violence, and Christianity in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, our moderator here today will be Mr. Bahati and Tama Bahati. Bahati has been with AFJN for 17 years. If I still remember Bahati, I hope I got that right. And he's very familiar with these issues. And um, he actually works on the nexus of governance um, and, and the various issues that AFJN has worked on. So I am not going to spend a lot of time. I will just pass on the mic to him. And Mr. Bahati will take us here and introduce our speakers including the folks who will be actually discussing the book. Thank you so much and welcome. Bahati. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Stephen, uh, for this uh, introduction. And this morning, through uh, Reverend uh, Father Emmanuel Cantongole's book, Who Are My People? Love, Violence, and Christianity in Sub-Saharan Africa, we are going to embark on a uh, profound exploration of African identity, Christianity, and the prevailing violence in Sub-Sahara Africa. Who are my people? This interdisciplinary study draws upon the domain of philosophy, theology, peace studies, and African studies to, among other things, answer these questions. Why do Africans kill their own people? Is the blood of tribalism deeper than the waters of baptism? On this journey to answering these questions, Father Katongole shed light on inspiring examples of individuals and communities who strive to transcend violence through transformative power of love. Then with us to discuss Father Katongole's book is Father Parende Medash Sane. Father Sane is a Jesuit priest from Burkina Faso. He is currently a fellow at Africa Faith and Justice Network and the co-founder of l'Institut de Recherche de la Paix au Sahel. He completed his doctorate studies in educational leadership and administration at the University of San Francisco in May of this year. He holds a master's degree in theology from Santa Clara University, a bachelor's degree, a bachelor's of art in philosophy from Université Loyola du Congo, and a certificate in public policy in public analysis from London School of Economics. Father Sané is an expert in environmental justice, peace building, leadership, Pan-Africanism, and human rights. He is also the author of seven books. His most recent publication is Manuel d'Education à la Paix en Afrique, published in 2020. Next is Miss Josephine Garmen. Miss Josephine Garmen is the incoming executive director of Hurley International Relief Foundation and serves as on the board of the Center for Action and Contempla Contemplation, the Michael and 
Mauritia Pacha Foundation and is on the National Council of Pax Christi USA. Ms. Garnet has over 26 years of experience in the international humanitarian sector. She is an experienced leader and a collaborator in community outreach, policy development, and cross-sector engagement strategies. She also served as the direct, as director of Montgomery Moving Forward and Continental African Liaison of Montgomery County Government Office of Community Partnership, among other roles for the county. She's also the founder and CEO of Kali Garment Foundation, a nonprofit focused on providing equitable health care education and economic development to underprivileged communities in Sierra Leone. And our next speaker is Father Abdon Rwandekwe. Father Rwandekwe is a Jesuit priest from Rwanda and author of the book titled Bishop Leon Paul Classé and the Paradigm Shift of Priesthood in Rwanda published in 2022. Currently, he is pursuing a doctorate, a doctorate in uh, education at the University of San Francisco, California. Alongside his studies, he serves as the lecturer at Arupe Jesuit University in Harare, Zimbabwe. He holds a master's degree in educational leadership and policy and another master's degree in theology and church history, both from Boston College. He also holds a BA in philosophy of education from l'Université catholique d'Afrique centrale, Yaoundé, Cameroon. And also he holds a BA in theology and humanities from Hekima University College in Nairobi, Kenya. I am your humble moderator. Let me just set a few rules before we start. In the event that our uh, discussion is interrupted, we resume using the same credentials, the same link. And for question and answers, please send them through the chat. And also at some point we open the mic so that people who want to speak can do so. Now, without any delay, um, Father Barende, Sane, take the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Bharti. Hi, everyone. It's a real delight to have you this uh, this morning, this afternoon, and uh, I see some familiar faces. And uh, to all of you that I'm who's I'm encountering for the first time through this uh, conference, I uh, greet you. It's a real joy to be part of this uh, intellectual journey today. So. My uh, sharing will uh, be, I hope, 20, uh, in 20 minutes. So I encountered Kota, uh, Katongole for the first time in 2018 when he uh, came in the Central African Republic for his uh, research. And I uh, encountered a very passionate person. And I saw in him a person who was uh, really uh, struggling with these specific uh, questions. Why do you Africans kill your own people? Is the blood of tribalism deeper than the waters of uh, baptism? What does it mean to be African? What is that I share with other Africans that makes them my people more than any history? friendship or relationships with Europeans or Americans could ever make them my people? Is it the color of my skin, history, geography, or culture that makes me naturally and thus without effort ally to other Africans more than to a Belgian or Norwegian? What does it mean to belong to a group of people called Africans? So Katangole was uh, really informed by these uh, questions. 
and more specifically, in his mind, the modern African crisis is uh, marked by a complex web of interconnected violence encompassing three prominent forms, ethnic violence, religious violence, and ecological violence. More specifically, this is what Katengole is saying, quote, I have been interested in the processes through which an imagination of violence has come to shape and drive Africans' modern institutions. That process has largely to do with a story through which Africa is at once rejected. Nothing good out of Africa and projected as the beneficiary of a European project of civilization, pacification, and development. Not only has this story given rise to a crisis which we have been describing following Wole Soyinka as the crisis of Africa's emergence into modernity, it is in turn, it in turns help to shape a unique modernity in which Africa trembles along as a perpetually disabled, deficient, and violent continent. Iran lies the root of Africa's laws, violence, end quote. So to Katengole, it's uh, very clear that the African crisis is fundamentally rooted in the definition of Africa by the colonizers as a continent from which we can expect absolutely nothing. And for him, this crisis is really what's informing the different forms of crisis in Africa. And the second wrong idea is to think that Africa is a continent who is to be defined as a beneficiary of the European project of civilization, pacification, and development. So Africans have been struggling within this wrong paradigmatic definition of a continent. So what does it mean to be an African? Katangole led us back in the past to encounter three fundamental Africans who can help us think about the meaning of understanding our own identity. First, it's Congolese Valentin Mudimbe. To Mudimbe, Western explorers, missionaries, and missions played a significant role in shaping the perception of African cultures and societies to serve their imperialistic and colonial agenda. They constructed an idealized version of Africa as a means to justify their actions. Explorers portrayed their invasion as a mission to civilize what they deemed as uncivilized territories. Missionaries introduced Christianity as a superior faith, seeking to replace local traditions they considered primitive or lacking. Furthermore, colonialist missions establish anthropology as a tool to categorize African behavior, effectively normalizing and institutionalizing colonization as a positive endeavor. So this is according to Mudibe, the fundamental portraying of Africa. 
it's the fruit of the colonialist and imperialist identification of a continent. And this was used by them to do Christianization, justify colonization, and of course, reflect on the discipline of anthropology. For Ali Mazrui, Africa, the modern Africa is a product of the interaction with other civilizations. Since the era of uh, ancient Egypt, going through the Middle Age with uh, the Songhai Empire in Mali, Tombuktu University, till the Arab invasion, colonization, the definition of a concept of Africa and being Africans has been the designation of outsiders. Africans used to define themselves as chemists. And then we have Anthony Apia. According to Apia, Africans' identity is beyond the biological notion of race and the dichotomy of we, blacks, and their whites. It's more than that. It's not only about dichotomic divisions, but it is something to be continually invented. And Katangole fundamentally shared this idea. Reason why he moved to the understanding of being an African Christian. Katangole himself is a Rwandan, Ugandan, American, African, Christian, and a Catholic uh, priest. A melting identification of being himself. So this book is not only about reflecting on people, it's also reflecting on himself. And this is what he's saying. He is sharing. I share my story with the hope that others may recognize a similar pattern in their own lives. A pattern of crossing boundaries, negotiating different identities and commitments, and developing an ever-expanding sense of my people, as well as a tendency to become part of communities that reflect a new we, defying and cutting across boundaries of race, nation, class, tribe, and ethnicity. And when they do, to the extent they do, they realize that they are part of a story, a movement, a revolution, a God drama. No doubt, the invitation to be part of a drama always finds one somewhere as a member of a tribe, ethnicity, race, and nation. But its goal is not simply to affirm, not simply to build onto that as though it were a foundation, but to turn that into a stepping stone for the journey, end quote. So to Katangole, our identity or our identities are to be understood as a continual journey. And this journey took Katangole to travel through many countries of Africa, including Rwanda, the Central African Republic, and Benin. And in Rwanda, Katongole had the privilege of meeting inspiring Christians who displayed remarkable resistance to violence and actively engaged to the process of healing for themselves and others. Beyond the horrors of ethnic violence, these individuals fostered communities where they transform violence 
into nonviolence, testifying the fact that the waters of baptism are really deep. The testimonies of Father Jean Baptiste and the unwavering commitment of Maggie Barankitse, who escaped violence in Burundi to establish Mezos Shalom and rescue children from massacre, serve as a powerful testament to various endeavors and efforts. Then, Katongole went to the Central African Republic, where I chanced to meet him and share on my understanding of defining the Central African Republic as a country where people need tangible revolution, where the church, in my understanding, is to be more prophetic. But my sharing was uh, nothing compared to what did uh, Father Bernard Kimvi. Father Bernard Kimvi is uh, a Togolese priest who exemplified solidarity, compassion, and dedicated his life to the sick, the needy, and the marginalized in the Central African Republic, where a crisis plagued millions of people and led them into indescriptible violence. Father Bernard embraced a distinct theological perspective that sees the church as good news for everybody. The church, in Father Bernard's understanding, is constituted by people who are able to consider their baptism as the deep understanding of what is making people united. He firmly believed that the true measure of a just society lies in how well it treats its most vulnerable members, the poor, the strangers, the homeless, and the sick. He contrasted the understanding of politics as something we have to use to grab power in using violence. Katongole found in Bernard, Father Bernard, the real understanding of doing participative politics. What does it mean? It means fleshing out the understanding of Matthew chapter 25, verse 31 to 46, taking care of the needy, the sick, and responding to what people are really expecting from others. So Father Bernard was, according to Katungoli, the highest expression of what it means to be religiously committed in Africa. And finally, Katengole went to Benin. In West Africa, he encountered a Dominican priest called Godfrey Nzamujo, who founded the Songhai Center in 1985. So Father Zamujo was here in the US at the University of California, California, I think it was, uh, yeah, California Irvine University. So Zamujo has three PhDs. But he decided to leave abstract understanding of knowledge and really tackle the pressing challenges of poverty, food and security, 
and unemployment in rural communities of Africa. Originally from Nigeria, he could not build his project in his home country, but it was only in Porto Novo in Benin that he was able to make his visionaries project really come true. At the core of the Songhai project lies a groundbreaking reinvention of African economics from the ground up. The purpose of Nzamujo is to empower Africans by providing training opportunities that allow them to harness existing resources and live with dignity. Central to the center's operations is an integrated system that combines crops, livestock, and aquaculture, where waste from one component becomes nourishment for another. This primary production serves as a foundation for secondary processes, including technology, processing, manufacturing, and tertiary services, such as markets, restaurants, and lodging. Fadan Jamuzo, who is a scientist, used Einstein's theory of relativity to understand the necessity for us not to make a dichotomic relation with nature, but to understand nature as being a part of us. He also used quantum physics in emphasizing the fact that energy is always moving between the different elements of nature. He promoted integral ecology. In his project of Songhai, you have spirituality, you have anthropological understanding of being human, you have sciences in their diversity, and you also have uh, Pan-Africanism, the capability of understanding that Africa is to stand up stand up from the imperialist definition of Africa as a continent of nothing to a continent of everything. And the idea of Songhai itself is from the Middle Age in the actual Mali. There was a wonderful and powerful kingdom there called the, king, the Empire of Songhai. And in this part of Africa, you have the University of Tombuktu. So Father Jamujo was inspired by this idea, telling Africans, if yesterday your ancestors were able to do that, what about you today? Stand up and give your best. I would like to conclude in saying this. According to Katongole, his people encompass those who embrace the concept of being eternal pilgrims, constantly envisioning and forging new paths through their religious beliefs, nationalities, philosophies, and values. Who are my people? My people are those who are capable of going beyond their skin color, their nations, their tribes, their values, to come out with the understanding of humanity as a community. These elements influence their identities and foster a sense of belonging. By transcending boundaries and recognizing our unique qualities, we possess the capacity to cultivate a fresh 
collective identity within communities united by love and nonviolence. This approach is essential for promoting actions that affirm life and for celebrating the profound symbolism embodied in the profound waters of baptism. Katongole witnessed in Magi the most exemplary response to ethnic violence in Africa. In Bernard Kimvi, he found the most inspiring answer to religious violence. And to Njamujo, he discovered the heroic response to ecological violence. Who are my people is, in my opinion, the best the highest expression of understanding theology today in Africa. I have never found something better than describing our actual situation of Africa than what I read in Katongole's book that I recommend you. And AFGN is part of this journey that consists in understanding Catholic social teaching as a continual understanding of what it means to be Christian today, no matter your origins or identities, and also understanding that the challenges we are confronting are not beyond us. We are capable of defying them in, and Katangoli is showing us the best way to achieve it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Father Parende, for that powerful message. I'd like to invite Miss Josephine Gar uh, Garmin to take the floor. Uh, Josephine is uh, is coming in as someone who read the book and would like to share what was her experience uh, in doing so. Josephine, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you so much and good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, wherever you are. Um, the book has Said, and thanks, Steve and AF, uh, AF, AFJN for giving us this opportunity to talk about the book and the opportunity for me to read the book. The book has stirred so much in me. I'm originally from Sierra Leone, and growing up, I have read about the war in Rwanda, and also, as you know, Sierra Leone um, encountered its own uh, horrible civil uh, war. A few days ago, I was in. Um, uh, an event with some youth where we were doing a mission trip and I was talking to the kids about the African tradition of Ubuntu and that came to me as I was reading the book you know I, I kept these thoughts and these feelings kept staring in me and like the African tradition of Ubuntu is profound and the complex concept that emphasizes this interconnectedness of humanity it encapsulates the belief that once humanity is intrinsically tied to the well-being of others. I grew up knowing that. I grew up believing in that. And that our well-being and is tied to those of others. And that others, their well-being is tied to us. And that we're all part of this greater whole. Ubuntu promotes compassion, empathy, and a sense of communal responsibility, which has been essential values in African societies for generations. I grew up again on that. However, amidst the rich tapestry of our African traditions, we cannot overlook the horrifying reality of the genocide that the book talks about. The stark reminder of the conflicts that we went through in Sierra Leone that is ongoing right now in Sudan, in DRC, and other areas. Tribal divisions and deep-seated hatred could lead to mass slaughtering of so many people, so many innocent lives. 
how can we participate in such a wave of violence that continues to shake the world? As an African woman and as a Catholic, I grapple a lot with this haunting question that I read in the book by Cardinal Echigari. Is the blood of tribalism deeper than the waters of baptism? It forces me to confront the painful tension between my African identity and my Christian faith. Christianity teaches us to love our neighbors as ourselves, to forgive and to seek reconciliation. Yet the genocide, conflicts that are ongoing, they challenge these principles, raising questions about the nature of our faith and the depths of our commitment to Ubuntu. To understand the complexities of this predicament, and the book also tells us about this, and I, you know, I, I really appreciated it, is that how we examine the impact of colonialism in Africa, the arbitrary division of the continent, the imposition of foreign ideologies, and the exacerbation of existing tribal tensions by colonial powers that continues to lay the groundwork for conflict. I grew up, I'll give a brief example, I grew up surrounded in the Catholic, I grew up in the Catholic Church, surrounded by beautiful white saints, the name of saints, pictures that depict white saints. But they looked nothing like me. And they looked nothing like my mom or my community around me. Like many I know, I was not even allowed to use my traditional name that my grandmother gave me, Jebu, um, as my baptismal name. And my parents had to use a European name. I struggled with my identity because of that. Am I, is my Africanness not enough? Is it not, can I not see the reflection of my, of who I am in my space? And am I less worthy? Is my name that is given to me by my grandmother less? As an African Catholic woman, I've, de I've dedicated most of my life to peace and nonviolence. The legacy of colonialism and the aftermath of genocide and ongoing conflict present both challenges and opportunities. After the brutal war in Sierra Leone, we surprised the world with peace and reconciliation between people and their perpetrators. Through my past work, I have witnessed the power of forgiveness and the possibilities of reconciliation across tribal lines. The reintegration of perpetrators of violence into society was challenging is a testament to the resilience of the human spirit and the potential for healing and our innate belief in what we believe to be Ubuntu. Yet, as I say this, it is disheartening to witness the world, particularly the West, turning a blind eye to the horrific crimes against humanity in African countries. I have to say, this is often driven by little strategic interest the international community selective attention to these tragedies undermine the pursuit of justice. And we see that, we read that in the book, the book talks about it, and we see that ongoing. It is a painful reminder of the lingering effects of colonialism and the enduring power and dynamics that continue to shape global responses to crisis. Nevertheless, in the face of such darkness, the importance of Ubuntu, reconciliation, and the pursuit of nonviolence remains paramount. The book also talks about love. Ubuntu calls us to embrace our shared humanity, to recognize the inherent dignity of every person, and to strive for justice and peace. It urges us to learn from the past, to confront the wounds of history, and to work towards a future where love and compassion triumph over hatred and division. As an African Catholic woman, I stay committed to promoting Ubuntu. We talk about the dangers of a single story. I believe in fostering forgiveness and facilitating reconciliation. 
I believe that by embracing these principles, we can chart a path towards a more harmonious and just society, one where the haunting questions of the past can be answered with the resounding affirmation that the book talks about, that the blood of tribalism is not deepened at the waters of baptism, and that the pursuit of peace and nonviolence is our shared responsibility and our collective hope. I really hope that you read the book and you gain insight into what it talks about. And I thank you for sharing my reflection. I have spent sleepless nights the past few days reading this book and absorbing it. And I, you know, I really hope you'll, you'll read that and, and experience it yourself. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Josephine, for your wonderful reflection. Next, I'll call on uh, Father Rwandekwe to take the floor. Uh, Father Rwandekwe, as I said before, he is a Rwandan and wrote a book about Bishop Leon Paul Classe and the paradigm shift of priesthood in Rwanda. In that book, um, Father Rwandekwe says that church leaders have always given an ethnic color to the Rwandan church instead of a national color. Now, that is a big claim. We're going to give him the floor so he can extrapolate on this question and also the question that um, Emmanuel Katongole posed. Is the water of tribalism deeper than the water of Christianity? Thank you. Father, you have the floor. Thank you, Bahati. Uh, can you see my presentation? Yes. Okay. So, okay, yeah. So you say it very well that uh, I wrote a book last year. Uh, this is the book about Bishop Leon Paul Class and the paradigm shift of priesthood in Rwanda. So Bishop Leon Paul Class was one of the, he was very influential as a bishop in Rwanda, and he's the architect of the Rwandan Catholic Church. So we had many bishops, one before him and many others after him, but he really stand to be really one of the, the monuments we have in the church. Yeah, so uh, I try to kind of respond to this question, is the blood of tribalism deeper than the waters of baptism, using the Rwandan situation as a, as a case. As we all know, the last 25 years, 30 years, Rwanda came to be kind of defined by its history of genocide. So when you talk of Rwanda, everybody say, oh, Rwanda, how are you? Are you okay now? Yeah, so <laughs> everybody know that we had this problem. And growing up, I could see, like, I'm one of those generation that who got their parents killed, who got their siblings killed, and we grow up without parents. And people my generation, we are hundreds of thousands of us like that. So when I grew up, I said, okay, I have to know what really happened to us as a people. So here I, I, want, I want to start with this Bible verse saying, no longer a slave, but something much better something much better than a slave a dear brother especially dear to me but how much more to you both on the natural plane and in the lord so the letter of saint paul to philemon chapter 1 verse 16. so what we see in this verse paul is basically begging philemon to take back his slave on his onesimus who had left him without permission. And the Paul's argument is that because both of them are now baptized Christians, they all share in that unbreakable bond of baptismal water. So Philemon is no longer his master as such, but a true brother in Christ. Now, why has this bonding of baptized people 
constantly failed in many places, and especially in sub-Saharan Africa, and above all, in my own country, Rwanda. Using the case of the Church of Rwanda, under the leadership of Bishop Leon Paul Klaas, I argue that reasons are many, ranging from natural greed among the people. Here I refer to us, the Rwandese, the local people, I also refer to the colonialist. So ranging from natural greed among the people to disastrous missionary strategies, including compromising where it was not necessary. So that's how I see, like, I can explain the problem. And of course, I use this bishop, knowing that many other bishops also came, but these, I find him to be very, very influential. Now, how did we get there? So there is this quotation I get from the book of Stefan Minayert. The book is called Le Père Blanc et la Société Rwandaise. And I think this uh, author is, is more or less accepted in Rwanda by both kind of sides as someone who really he has kind of objective writing. So he says this. The different protagonists, namely the white fathers, the population, the indigenous authority, and the colonial authority, masters. So these are four people. Each pursues its objective by trying to use the other to achieve its own. The colonial authority wants to make the colony profitable. The indigenous authority wants to strengthen its power. The population, the lower population, the Rwandese, they want to improve their living conditions. And the white fathers, the missionaries, they want to evangelize the country. And among these four protagonists, alliances are made and unmade in the name of their conflicting interest. So I wonder if among the conflicting interests, the waters of baptism was one of those. Now, when missionaries arrived in Rwanda, just, was just yesterday, they came on February 2nd, 1900, just 123 years ago. Rwanda was recovering from a bloody coup d'etat that happened in 1996, for which no reconciliation had taken place. The coup d'etat itself was a culmination of King Gwabujiri Rothre's reign. So this is a guy who ruled Rwanda for 30 years. He just died a year or two before the arrival of missionaries. Now, uh, probably I can read some paragraph of my book here. Here, it said that, in fact, from the dawn of history, what came to be known as Rwanda was an agglomeration of independent chieftaincies in which people lived according to their lineages. However, towards the 14th, and 15th century, one chief of the name of Ndahiro Ruyanye, who represented the one clan called Avanyiginya, had this brilliant imperialist idea of annexing other chieftaincies and managed to secure a position of first among equals, among other representatives of chieftaincies and lineages. But during the 16th and 17th and 18th centuries, his successors slowly destroyed the power of other lineages, established clientage, and transformed their roles into a veritable centralized power, which reached its apex under King Kijeri IV, Gwabujiri, the one I say that ruled Rwanda for 30 years. 
Although the process of centralization intensified in the mid of 17th century, it was the Moa Miroa Bujiri who thoroughly consolidated the system of clientage, smashed the power of the lineage, and centralized the powers of the chiefs. Guabujiri's expansion of his kingdom through conquest was accompanied by the wholesale extermination or uh, incorporation of previous independent lineage based elite and the systematic appropriation of lineage, community, and fellow lands. And this king brought the notables to heal through ruthless terror and astute manipulation of rivalries. So at his death, some years, two or three before the arrival of missionaries, Rwanda was in a very, very delicate situation, both outside and within. And Rwanda was threatened by, from outside by white explorers and colonialists who were almost at the door of the kingdom. And this was an ine inevitable problem, especially since the king had encountered some of them in Uganda during some of his expeditions. As for the missionary threat, Rwabujiri might have been informed about the killing of Christians by the Kabaka and the political crisis between Protestant and Catholics in, in Uganda. It is not clear whether he knew the, the difference between the colonialists and the missionaries, but he knew he died knowing that something bad was coming in Rwanda. And Rwanda's social harmony was going to be put on trial. And it was obvious, as will be shown later, that people of the lower class, they were ready to welcome any influence that could take them out from under the yoke, which had become unbearable for the common Rwandans. And inside Rwanda, the thorniest issue was the deterioration between lords and peasants, which had taken an ethnic character or a, radical, a radicalization of social classes under this king. So by the end of the 19th century, Rwanda was already a centralized hierarchical kingdom with important class distinctions. The majority of the people could not make their living independently. They were obliged to bond themselves with a Tutsi lord who would eventually exploit them. Though it is difficult to know the exact origin of the distinctions between ethnic or social groups in Rwanda, Guabujiri's oligarchical or or administration had exacerbated distinction between Hutu, Tutsi, and Tua, which apparently did not previously have a great importance in the configuration of the Rwandan society because it had been based more on lineages and clans. And this ethnic distinction created favoritism and pride among the ruling class who were mostly Tutsi and dissatisfaction among the peasants who were mostly Hutu. Now, coming back to my PowerPoint, at this time when the missionary came, because they came like, the colonials came, then a year later, the missionaries arrived. So Rwandan people were so divided. In Rwanda, we call it memu kendamu, it means they were into a survival mood, which I think it wasn't a good time for the for other influences to come by. Now, for your own information, in Rwanda, actually, the way Rwanda was ruled, some kings, depending on their names, they were to establish peace and prosperity among the people. And some other kings were to enlarge the country by attacking neighbors and looting them. And this king I'm talking about was one of those kings, the name that he had been given for his kingship was the name of a, a warlord. So he had to fight. So it is my belief that if Christianity had come to Rwanda at a period of peaceful 
and prosperity moment, I am sure we'll be saying a different good story about ourselves. Now, my second point is about missionary strategies. So the first bishop to bring Christianity in Rwanda, his name is Bishop Hilt. He, in my opinion, he was so patient and deep. So one of the things he did when he came to Rwanda, he established that people to be baptized, they will have to undergo four years of catechism. And then when he arrived, of course, under the influence of the Germany who first came to Rwanda as colonizers, he went to see the king and the king said, okay, you can evangelize the lower people, but don't touch the ruling class. You cannot evangelize the ruling class. The ruling class, who most were Tutsi, are my people. I'm the only one to teach them. You cannot evangelize, but the lower class, go and do whatever you want with them. He started by evangelizing the lower classes. So in Rwanda, the Hutu were the first who joined the Catholic Church. But then Bishop Class came to Rwanda actually before Hirt. Because Hilt was first in Tanzania and then was moved to Rwanda as a bishop. But Klaas had arrived some years before him as a priest. And he was younger than Hilt. And he knew Rwanda very well. But he had a different idea. He always tell Bishop Hilt, you know what? This church you are building on the lower classes doesn't have a future. Look at our own places in Europe. We had to make sure that the church align with powerful people. So you will have to do the same way in Rwanda. And fair or unfair enough, Bishop Hilt, when he came to Rwanda, he was already old. He ruled for like 10 years because he arrived in Rwanda, I think in 19, around 1910. Then he, he stopped ruling Rwanda, the Church of Rwanda in 1922, I guess. And then class who happened to be one of the priests in those days who really knew Rwanda, he became his replacement. And of course, when he became his replacement, I believe Klaas was a good person, but he had kind of disastrous strategies for missionary activities. He was also an opportunist, full of ambition and ready to compromise. So compromise here, I mean, to accept the standard that are lower than is desirable. So he said, okay, four years of catechism is too much. One year will be okay. Never and half of it is fine. And then he started compromising about everything. So just one paragraph. I hope I'm not being too much. Yeah, so here he... So he created what we call in the Rwandan Catholic Church, La Tornade. So La Tornade is this moment that happened in Rwanda in the 30s when class became a bishop, where the ruling class came to the church en masse. So all of them decided to be Catholics. And then these are some of the criticism of his own brother. He said, however, La Tornade, no matter how splendidly it was presented by Catholic apologetics, presented some lacuna even during class's time. And the most virulent critic was the quality. Here you hear me there, very well. The quality of Christians it produced. And I think for us, that's where as a church of Rwanda, we start going down. That's where the blood of tribalism takes, I think they becomes even bigger than the waters of baptism. The most virulent critic was the quality of Christians it produced. First of all, there was a movement of young elite members that educated Batuar and Bakarani who accepted baptism only because it was a fashion, but never understood anything when it came to Christian life. So the second critique was about the number of catechumens, which humanly speaking was impossible to be taken care of by the limited number of missionaries available. Some priests urged class to raise the years of catechumenate back to four years. Indeed, class had shortened the years of catechumenate from four to two and some time less. 
in order to allow the crowd to be baptized and especially the elite. Unfortunately, this relaxation in the catechumenate produced a superficially Christian flock who did not know much about its raison d'etre or its identity. Protestant missionaries who observed helplessly how the ruling class was becoming Catholic, they made fun of new Catholic convent superficiality in matters of faith in these terms. Everywhere the same story is told of hurriedly baptized convent, no, converts knowing only a few prayers, unable to read, fed on Latin mass and distinguished from their heathen neighbors only by the black birds of a rosary, turning back even from the outward performances which had never touched their hearts. So this is the, Catholic, the kind of Catholicism we got after this bishop. Now, the outcome after Bishop Class's reign, the outcome was apparently good because under the Bishop, Rwanda got kind of a recognition by Rome, but by Pope Pius XII, if I'm not mistaken, because it was becoming a Catholic kingdom at the heart of Africa. So Rwanda had embraced Catholicism as a national creed. But there was a problem, the problem of social promotion, education, health, social mobility, political influence, and so on. So people joined the church for these things that mostly have nothing to do with the waters of baptism. Elite conversion versus popular uprising. That was another problem. And above all, a divided clergy and the overflowing to the people. The clergy being the first intelligentsia that Rwanda had, so you can imagine that if they are divided, then it overflows to the people. Now, our hopes, I can say many things, but I don't want to be that long. Let's finish here. Our hopes. In the midst of all these complexities, Rwanda, of course, has had and still has very good and committed priests and Christians in general who managed to go beyond the blood of tribalism. In our recent history, we have some names. There is this guy, Mr. Cyprien Rugamba and his wife, Dafros. Right now, there is a process of canonization that is on its way. So this was an exemplary family in Rwanda before the genocide. They were killed during the genocide because of their ideas. They are kind of, they were just exemplary as Christians. It's one of the few families in Rwanda in those days that had the holy, the, the holy the tabernacle in their house. And Cyprian was a Hutu person and Daphros was a Tutsi. It was a mixed family. We have this sister, Felicite Niteyeka. May you have heard of about her. She's a Hutu sister whose brother was a high ranked in the army that committed the genocide. And then the sister, during the genocide, she said the brother came to take her, to put her out of danger. She said, no, I cannot leave unless you take me with my other sisters who are not of my ethnic groups. You can, if you can shelter all of us, I will go. If you can't, then all the best. I'm staying here with them and they were all killed. Then we have Father uh, Augustin Zavera from the parish of Muramba, and then Rambos Komunyaneza from Mukarani Parish. All these were also killed because they refused to abandon the people who were wanted during the genocide. But also we, the people in Rwanda, we know many other people we know locally. At the local community level, we, who protected their neighbors? from the other ethnic group during the Rwandan civil war, during the genocide against the Tutsi, and even after. So we know Hutus who did this. We know Tutsis who did this. Because our history is like at one point, the Hutu have to protect the Tutsi. At one point, the Tutsi have to do the same. Unfortunately, that has been our history. But there is hope. But all in all, 
the majority of simple Christians have gone beyond the blood of tribalism. But there is still much to do at church leadership level. The Catholic Church in Rwanda, I might say, has a very big weakness that I think it is a bishop class's legacy. He does not know how to survive as an independent institution without the help of the government. We have seen this from the time of class until today. And this is what I find to be a big problem. And that's why it was caught up into genocide narratives and has been accused of failing to reconcile Rwandan society. Thank you. This is what I had to share with you. Thank you so much, uh, Father Rwandekwe, for your insights. Um, I shared the link to Father Katongole's uh, book. I'm going to share the link to Father Randekwe's book and as well as um, Father uh, Barwende's uh, book. You can find them on Amazon. Now, I know that uh, you have questions. I would like to open up uh, the microphone for uh questions and comments uh please if you have a comment uh raise your hand and then we will take it from there but let me just pose a question to all of you i remember when i was in in primary school the missionaries forbid it for forbid uh our community to sing traditional songs during um, during weddings and other things, but uh, recommended or or urged us to sing church uh, songs. When we think about our identity and the strategy used then. We lost memories of um, our cultural heritage or throughout the reign of this kind of uh, missionary, uh, uh, missionary um, pastoral uh, approach. We lost many talented singers who normally would come up with these songs to tell the stories of the community and the struggle of women and so on. I would like your comment on these kind of strategies and how we can amend this, because this is not over. And finally, you as um, uh, you um, as Catholic priest, uh, I'd like you to comment on the fact that, uh, for example, in Sierra Leone and um, Nigeria, two bishops were assigned by the Pope to a certain community the community refused them because they weren't from their ethnic groups. Please make comments and then we follow up uh, with um, questions and uh, uh, Stephen will be uh, first to ask questions. Thank you. Who is okay. responding? Uh, uh, let's go with Father Randeque and then uh, Father uh, Barende after. Thank you. You are muted. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Baha. Thank you for asking those important questions. And uh, I think you are really, you are right. Now, the question about, the comment about missionaries forbidding people to sing in their own languages in the ceremonies. I mean, I just have to say, for me, I call them, we had very good missionaries, but also some of them were lazy. Now, when I, what, when I say they were lazy, it means, there is this idea of inculturation. But if you want to leave the inculturation, you have to go and see the people and learn their culture so that you can be able to, like, you know, to talk Christianity with them in their culture. But some, because of laziness, they say, hey, no, this is too much. Just tell them that their culture is bad and then you give them what we know. And I find it to be a kind of intellectual laziness. You just don't want to learn 
so, like what other people do and know so that you can bring Christianity in that. You just say, okay, because I can't understand this, because I can't do this, I just put it aside and give them what I know, what I'm comfortable with. I think that's what happened. But some missionaries, they were open to that. At least for me growing up in Rwanda, even today we sing our traditional songs in the church, we dance the way we want, and it's fine. Yeah, and this actually, it goes back from the time like 15th century, 16th century, just for you to know, there was this fight between Jesuit and Franciscan in China. When they went to evangelize China, Matteo Ricci and others. And then the, 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 the Jesuit said, okay, guys, let us try to evangelize, to evangelize Chinese in Chinese culture. The Franciscan said, no, that is anathema. You cannot do that. Then they reported them to the Pope. And then they got sanctioned. Uh, yeah, so you have all this tension in the church. But for me, I say those type of missionaries, good people, but lazy. Yeah, that's what I can say about that. Now, in the story of Nigeria, you said, I remember it was like five or six years ago when a bishop was appointed to a diocese and the, the people of that diocese refused to welcome the bishop. And then Francis punished them by saying, okay, don't want the bishop, no sacrament. For like five years, I don't know what happened after, but I remember, I think that bishop resigned because he realized there was just an impasse. Yeah, the thing is, probably a Nigerian person can respond this better than I can do, but what I heard was like, in the Nigerian church, there is one tribe that gives bishop. Let's say on 50 bishops, you have 25 coming from one tribe. And those people from the diocese who refused the bishop, they were kind of saying, no. So sending us someone from that tribe that has been giving bishops around, you are meaning that we don't have someone of us who is qualified to be a bishop. So it was a reaction to a kind of an ongoing situation in Nigeria, which I can compare probably, I'm not sure, but pro like here in the US, in the history of the Catholic Church here, at one point, I guess the majority of bishops were from Irish origin. So let's say an Italian person said, no, we don't want these things. Why can't we have a bishop of, you know, of Spanish origin or Italian? Why would every bishop be of an Irish or something? So that would happen in Nigeria. And I'm not saying they were right or wrong, but it's an ongoing struggle in that country where they say every bishop cannot come from this tribe. But that tribe that gives bishop happened to be the first and the most Christianized tribe in Nigeria. So anyway, yeah, these are local problems and we have to deal with them as they come. Thank you. I'll, I will add briefly, briefly and shortly to what was said. To the first question, I will say this. We need courageous church leaders from Africa who can really challenge Rome the Vatican, shaking the coconut trees of a church institution and helping people understand that we, the black people from Africa, we did not come in the church to accompany others. We also come to enrich the church with our songs, our music, our dances, and even more. But for that, we need courageous leaders. This is my strategy. The second question about Nigeria, I would say this, Africa has its own demons. Like what uh, Abdul said, we were already fighting in our own problems like other people in Europe and elsewhere. We already had our own crisis. The expectation of Christianity to repair everything is also part of a journey. What does it mean? It means everywhere in Africa, Christianity did not erase our local problems. It's a remaining challenge. It's a remaining journey to be made. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Stephen, please say you have the floor. Oh, thank you, Bahati. And um, I just want to thank um, these wonderful presentations from all three of you. I, I'm going to say I learned a lot from this. And um, 
And this really speaks to what AFGN does, you know, um, with, you know, working with, our, I always say, our dual identity as Africans, um, you know, focusing on African issues, also as Christians and also as Catholics, to be even much more specific. So, you know, operating on all these three um, nexuses, I think it really kind of, this kind of hones in terms of how we navigate this very complex space, but also very mutually ex inclusive space, actually. Now, I, 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 I was uh, just with asking this question. Um, I, I also learned a lot about um, um, in terms of who are my people, you know, um, using Christianity to eliminate Africa's crisis of belonging. Now, I don't know what that crisis was, um, you know, in terms of what um, the author really meant, because the crisis of whether it's race, crisis of ethnicity, crisis of um, regionalism. So we have all these different levels of how we identify ourselves. And this kind of speaks to um, when you go into our countries, whether it's elections we are having, whether it's um, religion, how we identify ourselves in this little strop and troops. Now, Christianity, I think what um, what what the author is saying, it can actually in itself um, help us offer resources, how we can navigate this space in nonviolent ways. And I think he talks about the need to point to stories, you know, um, to provide those images as a way of, or metaphors, if you would, as a way of identifying, um, as a way of, you know, going through this journey. And I see Josephine identified a few and, you know, talking about the role of the church in Sierra Leone. Um, and um, also, um, you know, um, Father Sane, I think the specific individuals that you identify, the Songhai Empire, the, the Songhai uh, the Songhai Project in Benin and those different priests and what they are doing, many of them outside their own communities in a way, and identifying how they can actually invent new ways of loving, if you would. Um, but also we see this very complex nature where Christianity has in itself brought its own complexity to Africa. Um, for instance, this idea of what Josephine talked about, you know, our identity, you know, some of us had to change our names just to be baptized, you know, which really speaks to why wouldn't I be Bana, as we say in my men, late native Mende, why wouldn't I use that to get baptized in a Catholic church? But rather I have to be Stephen or something else. And normally that name sticks in itself and it becomes my official name. And in the process, I lose my initial identity. And so I think we fought with that over the years. And um, so I guess my question is <clears throat> to all three of you, you know, um, do you see Despite his argument that Christianity can be used to really um, help ab amplify these individual stories as a way of reunifying us, do you see Catholicism, to be more specific for those of you, I know all three of you are Catholics, have, do you, have you seen Catholicism as really fostering that in a way while trying to do so? Or have you seen Catholicism as actually making these differences much more difficult? And if that's the case in the latter, what can we learn from this book to basically ampl amplify and bring people together to solve our ethnic crises in different countries, to solve conflicts um, in a more unified way? For instance, those of us who are coming from, from, from backgrounds where we have Muslims as mothers, we have Christ fathers as Christians, and making our own choices. How do we use um, the baptism, the water, the baptism, to really um, um, bring us together as opposed to really dividing us or, you know, using these different things. How do you see we have been? Have we made much progress since um, changing away from those? And I think I throw that question to all three of you, if you can actually highlight that in light of the book that you've read. I yield back. All right, thank you. Any, anyone can take the question. Thank you. Maybe Josephine first, <laughs> as we didn't hear I you. Will. I will I will try, but it, again, so there is something we usually say, right? It's uh, having the faith of Christ versus having the faith in, in Jesus. So having the faith of Jesus versus having the faith of uh, having the faith of Jesus versus having the faith in Jesus. It's, it's you know sometimes I feel like we so the Catholic Church, yes can do a lot of change, can influence. A lot of good things have come out of the Catholic Church. We've had some of the best schools, the best education, the best you know, hospitals, medical care has come out of that. What I feel is it is the individual, and I think, uh, Father Sani, you said that, it's the individuals we have to call to task about how they translate the faith. Just because a priest or bishop is Catholic, 
does not mean they are truly implementing or living the faith as it is. And that is what we must always hold our priests, um, whoever in the, in, the, in the leadership, we have to hold them accountable. And we have to keep calling them out that, you know, there is a reason why Jesus did not go. And I'm not going to preach because we have too many priests and religious people. Yeah, I'm not a priest. There is a reason why Jesus did not baptize John in the beginning and why he had John baptize him. And I believe that is to show service and to show humility that he's there to serve. And sometimes I feel like the patriarchy in the church forgets that and we lose sight of that and we come in to impose our own political and personal views on communities versus really preaching this word of love, forgiveness, embracing and all. But it is being done. I think we are very lucky to have Pope Francis who is revisiting and bringing that up. And he's facing a lot of challenges, not from us, the people, but from his priests and bishops and archbishops. Let us not forget that. You know, the impact of what has happened in many faiths has not been the faith itself, the Catholic faith itself. It has been those people who hold power, who go there with their own personal biases and their own power struggles, and they impose that into that. I mean, there are many things even St. Augustine could have done that could have changed the trajectory of, of Catholicism. So anyway, that's what I'm going to say. But yes, I believe in the core Catholic faith, and I believe that there's a lot that Catholicism can bring and continues to bring with us in that. And uh, if you, you know, want to, and I think the book speaks on that a lot, and you can also visit the Pax Christi USA site, and you will see a lot of that as well. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, person. Yes, go ahead, uh, Father Sani. Yeah, I just want to say there is hope. There is hope because you have more and more people and institutions uh, that are really understanding that what is really important is not the abstract elements, but the capacity to bring the faith really on the real ground. The struggle we have right now, as uh, Josephine uh, shared, is fundamentally about serving the institution or serving the spirit of the institution itself. So when you see people fighting against Pope Francis, it's fundamentally about their own egocentric understanding of their culture as being the best. The egocentric understanding of their countries, their nations, their music, their names, their names as the best. This is what I called using my culture to reign over the institution. Francis is bringing the church to the spirit of Christ himself. That means this, no matter your skin color, black, white, and even blue, come in the church and follow this baptism, which is deeper than all of that. But there is hope when I see what is happening in the institutions beyond the church itself. When I see lay people very committed, loving the church, organizing this kind of discussion, I really have hope. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Remigius, you, uh, I'm not sure you, if you had something to, to say because I, I saw that you were trying to unmute yourself. Uh, you have an opportunity to say something if you wanted to say something. Thank you. Go ahead and unmute yourself. Uh, Remigius, you are not, um, you are still muted. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Thank you. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. And uh, thank you for sharing your thoughts. I appreciate uh, this kind of conversation. I must admit, I have not read the book under review, but the, the content uh, speaks to my uh, deepest anxieties and impulses. Let me quickly uh, uh, make the comment that um, uh, the, the book 
I, it seems to me, uh, it's, it's a theological book. I am of the opinion that we are doing theology in Africa and uh, most other places without interrogating the philosophy that is behind the theology. And so, because we are doing theology in this philosophical vacuum, we are then trying all sorts of things because we are not addressing the problems on the ground. So, we want to continue most of the time uh, not recognizing the mistakes made by the uh, missionaries, and we just want to continue uh, the same old thing, you know, maybe put paint here, uh, put a, a varnish there, and so on. So, my dear brothers and sisters, I think that we need to revisit the philosophy on which the missionary project was based. And that philosophy was that those of us in Africa are less than. And the priests and nuns of the day, not knowing as much, they just followed, did what they could, but essentially implementing this inhuman philosophy that humanity is not universal and we are not equal. So they came as this desire to uh, elevate our humanity to be like theirs. There is no need to listen to us or uh, listen to our music or because, of course, it is pagan. And uh, our religion is not as high as this. So, to make the story short, my brothers and sisters, what I think is we have to go beyond the church missionary education we received, whether it was in biology class, whether it was in history class, whether it was in church catechism or whatever. It was what I designate as church missionary education. We have to transition, and that is what is operating now. With all the theologies I see going around in culturation theology and so on, they seem to be uh, reinforcing this model, this church missionary education. We need to transition from this church missionary education to what I call Christian religious education of the Gospels, where we encounter Christ without going to Christ through Irish or German or French, we need to encounter Jesus in the Gospels. Thank you. Christian religious education. Thank this, you so my much. dear friends, is my contribution to this. I thoroughly enjoyed your presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. We are out of time and there is a need for us to respect the rendezvous we gave each other. But allow me to say that um, we are not here to generalize the missionary project as bad, but we have to acknowledge and give credit to the many missionaries who did so much good um, in our communities, building schools, hospitals, and embracing the inculturation when the moment came for the, uh, the inclusion of our traditions to be in the liturgies. I want to shout out to the many missionaries who have set up this Africa Faith and Justice Network, which is hosting this event today, with the idea to promote the Africans they loved, the Africans among whom they lived, who were not known here in the United States and in the Western public. We hosted this event to promote peace, to promote diversity, to promote, to promote the one human family 
that we know of through the preaching of the gospel. And also in the light of what Father Zamujo uh, had done to promote the care of our common home, of the environment. Thank you all for coming. I'd like to give uh, the last word to Evgen Director, who we um, then close this meeting. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Bahati. Thank you. And um, I just want to thank, I think I'm, I'm going to spend 30 seconds to say this. I want to thank our really very, very um, highly informative um, um, <clears throat> speakers. You did your research and you really provided a really broad overview of the book. And um, and I think I'm pretty sure for many of the people who are only hearing about the book for the first time, I think it really is an eye opener in terms of really trying to read the book and really digest it. <clears throat> Africa Faith and Justice Network. Um, this is the work we do. Our focus is always on how to get the Catholicism work in a through Catholic social teaching in Africa in action. So if you want to call it the faith in action, where we go out there and really make a difference in the lives of our brothers and sisters from the bottom up approach. And we have done that for 40 years. We are going to be 40 years this year, and we just want to say many of you might receive an invitation to come to our event to celebrate with us, um, to also thank you for what you have done for our organization and for Africa, by the way, to allow us to continue to do this. We are very grateful for that and for the people who have funded us. I want to thank Josephine. Um, I call my sister who, you know, at the last minute and uh, accepted this and, um, you know, took the time to read the book and actually provide a reflection. She's a reservoir of knowledge. I'm very sincerely grateful to you. I want to thank Father Adnan and Father, I have never met you before, but I heard about your book. And then when I saw your profile, I was very excited and I'm looking forward to reading your case study on Rwanda because I think it really provides a case study of a theory that we are kind of exposing. Thank you so much for that. And finally, I want to thank um, Father Sane who really um, initiated this project that we are having a conversation about and Father for a really good way of presenting the book to us in a way that I think I'm um, reading it wouldn't have done that. Thank you so much. And Bahati, I want to thank you for moderating this. And Lydia, who normally provides, um, you know, the tech and make sure that she's at the background of making sure everything runs smooth. And, and I want to thank our Reverend Fathers and our sisters and our community who are always here. I know you, I see you, and I know you are always with us. Thank you for your hard work and thank you for promoting AFJN. And thank you for standing with us. God bless you all. And thank you. And you have a very wonderful rest of the week. Bye-bye.